Hi everyone, I'm Dr. John DeYard and welcome to LifeSpa.com where we prove the ancient medical wisdom of Ayurveda with modern science. And today I want to talk about healing with the light of your own biophotons. Biophotons are, are e photons emitted out of your DNA and they can be either coherent and healing or they can be either incoherent and damaging. So let's dig in. The four goals of life in Ayurveda is called the Purush Arthas. Purush meaning soul, Artha meaning for the purpose of. So the four goals of life are really in Ayurveda for the purpose of the soul. Kama, which is pleasure. The lesson there is to realize that the greatest pleasure comes from not getting and receiving, but forgiving. The second is uh, Artha, which is wealth and accumulating wealth and, and realizing that it's never going to really make you happy and learning how to be unattached to the fruits of your labor and using the wealth for, you know, caring for others and helping others. Dharma is the laws of nature. It's not getting that perfect job. It's aligning your lifestyle with the cycles of nature, the circadian rhythms, syncing up your biological clocks with nature's circadian rhythms, being in sync with those natural rhythms. And finally, moksha. Moksha is that thinning or removing the veil between the physical and the spiritual. The four goals of life are in the direction of thinning that veil between the physical body and our spiritual life. The definition of Ayurveda, there's two definitions of Ayurveda that I like. One is called the science of life. Ayu is life, Veda is science. It means living in sync and harmony with the natural circadian rhythms of life, going downstream with the current syncing your biological clocks up with nature's circadian rhythms, light-dark cycles. But the second definition is where Ayu is life and Veda is truth, and truth never changes. Vedic science has been constant for thousands of years. It never changes. So part of us, the immortal part of us that never changes, is our soul. And even our thoughts, which is a little bit scary, but those thoughts never change. They, they continue. So in Ayurveda, the whole purpose of Ayurveda is to bring the balance back in the physical body. Balance Vata Pitta Kapha, help have our physical health be really good. Then move the prana and the life force to, to wake us up and become more self-aware of the problems as problems, as underlying imbalances. The body can recognize imbalances and fix them spontaneously. The whole point of Ayurveda is to raise our vibration, to become more self-aware, to thin the veil between physical and spiritual, and to wake up to our true potential, in fact, our true ability, to not only be a physical body, but to, to become an instrument that can refine its perception to ultimately, eventually be somewhat of a realized passenger on this crazy journey of the soul. So to thin the veil between the physical and the spiritual, first we have to start by looking at something called Pragya Parad. Pragya Parad is what we call in Ayurveda, the cause of disease. And it means the mistake of the intellect, where the intellect makes a mistake by thinking it's separate from the whole, right? We know in quantum physics that there's fields that become matter. And in Ayurveda, when that matter forgets that it's part of the field, that's the cause of disease the mistake of the intellect. When the field of consciousness becomes the physiology and the physiology forgets that it's sourced in that field, at the junction point between the field and physiology is where the imbalance exists. And if we could then put our attention at the junction point between the field and the physiology, we could, in a sense, put the light at the doorway and shine the light in both directions and wake up the body to recognize that its true self is a field of intelligence or consciousness. It's not just a bunch of parts functioning independently. So it turns out that at the junction point between consciousness and matter, we're looking for something that would be both a particle and also a field or a waveform. And it turns out that our body emits those, and they're called ultra-weak biophoton or ultra-weak photon emissions or biophotons which are released out of your DNA. And as I said earlier, they can be either coherent or they can be incoherent. We know that they're information carrying particles within our body. They carry information throughout our body. We release thousands of them per second out of our DNA. 
Researchers are now are suggesting that it's the biophotons which travel at the speed of light that allow us to think so fast because nerves, firing nerves to nerves, it's really laborious and slow. And it doesn't, it doesn't go fast enough to explain how we can sometimes think so fast. So they're looking at all kinds of new ways that these photon emissions are actually helping us heal and think and function. What's interesting is that the human body is not only a, a, a carrier of these biophotons or a producer of these biophotons, it's also an emitter of them, a transmitter of them, and a receiver of them. So these photons are not limited to us, right? Because they're functioning at the junction between consciousness and us, field, and matter. So they're everywhere, you know, and they're traveling at great distance at the speed of light. Einstein called it spooky action at a distance. And they're going to be entangled with other people. So in other words, if uh, these biophotons, if you were thinking you were going to go have a lunch with someone in a couple of days and you're releasing these biophotons and you um, and had a lunch date, your biophotons that you're releasing would be entangled with the biophotons that they're releasing. Then all of a sudden we would have a relationship days before we would meet. Turns out that these biophotons are actually affected by our own intention. So if we have an intention to do something, like meet someone, and the other person has an intention to meet you, even though you haven't met, you can have a relationship for days and days and days before you actually meet. So like I said, these biophotons can be either coherent and healing, or they can be incoherent and damaging. You know, you walk into a room, sometimes you go, ooh, this is a toxic environment. Those are toxic biophotons you're experiencing. Or you walk into a room and it's delightful. There's something they call it the bystander effect. They did a study with a monkey and they put a monkey, had a monkey who was radiated for certain types of cancer and they put a healthy monkey next to it and they let them be for 48 hours and after 48 hours they measured the healthy monkey and there was significant DNA damage to the healthy monkey and they measured that the, that the mechanism for that damage was incoherent or damaging biophotons. So the strange things about these biophotons is they can be coherent or incoherent or damaging or, in, or, 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 or healing. So based on Elizabeth Blackburn's research on telomeres, who won the Nobel Prize, who found that these telomeres, which are caps on your DNA that protect your DNA and your genetic code, they are really shortened and the DNA therefore damaged as a result of stress and processed food and excessive activities and things like that. And when you meditate and do yoga and breathing, the telomeres lengthen and the DNA damage is significantly less. Well, studies also show that the biophotons that exists at the junction between the light that, that exists at the junction between consciousness and matter. In fact, it's probably where the light emerges out of the junction between consciousness and matter. We know that that light is, um, can be coherent or incoherent. So if we meditate and do yoga and breathing, we can create this coherent biophoton. And when that happens, all the loud DNA damage biophotons released, which are released as a result of free, to free radical damage or reactive oxygen species damage from stress, that dials down and you're left with this silent release of really pure biophotons, which do the healing. And those biophotons are affected by our intention. So that could explain why prayer works at great distances. I pray if I'm hopefully, you know, in a sattvic balanced state, I am creating coherent biophotons and my intention can be carried at great distance, as Einstein called it, spooky action at a distance, and create a healing effect at great distances. And this is why prayer works <clears throat> in many studies, so many studies, and some studies show that it doesn't really work that well. And that could be explained because the biophoton releases were overwhelmed by the incoherent and damaging biophotons. We didn't get clear intention. Biophoton intention has been shown to affect random event generators, like at the lottery. So if you do it right, you could get the right lottery numbers. Um, and it's affected by our intention. So when I was living in India, uh, it was very common. We would go see a healer who would do distance healing and he would look at a picture of a relative and he would take your pulse or just look and, and, have a, and create a healing effect with the, with the person who was ill at home at great distances, something that was well known in Ayurveda. So these therapies of becoming more self-aware at the junction between consciousness and matter is not um, 
a strange phenomenon. It's a very common thing in Ayurveda. So there are many of these gap therapies, sandhi therapies, uh, what we call sandhi chikitsa or junction point therapies. You know, for example, marma points. Marma points are the points on the body that are considered vital points, junctions between arteries and nerves and veins and muscles and tendons. But there's 108 of these very vital points, and if you hurt them or damage them, it was reported in the Vedic literature that it would cause severe damage in specific ways. But if you enliven them, they can be very healing, similar to the whole biophoton thing. You aggravate them, they're incoherent. You love them, they're coherent. And, uh, and so that's one of the classic gap or junction point therapies. Um, the junction point between the seasons in Ayurveda is called Ritu Sandhi. Ritu Sandhi is the gap between the seasons. Um, it's the seven days before the season changes and the seven days after. During that transition, they say 2,500 years ago in Charka, when it was written, they said that the disease would take its first foothold during that transition. We know as the transition happens at that junction point between seasons, the light changes. This is all about light. And when the light changes, um, the, for example, the infrared light starts to move into the sky, the earth gets warmer, the infrared light penetrates deeply into the soil, activates the mitochondria in the little microbes in the soil, creates a microbial surge that then creates a whole new stable of microbes for the springtime that are attracted to specific roots like dandelion and things like that uh, in the soil. And then when you pull them and eat them, you inoculate your gut with those bugs for that season that would have a, a decongesting effect in the spring and a different set of bugs in the summer to dissipate heat and a different set of bugs in the, in the winter to boost your immunity. And we have science to show that our immune system does in fact get stronger in the winter. So we are circadian beings and we need to act like them, eat in a seasonal way. And of course, I have a whole seasonal eating guide where you can, where you can get the, the right food in the right season to make sure you're inoculating your gut in the right way. Studies even show that there are certain bugs like actinobacteria that are specifically predominant in the gut in the, in the springtime for digesting things like fat and fiber, which are more predominant in the spring. And in the end of summer and the fall when the starch and the fruit and the grains are being harvested, we, are, we have a different species of bugs that predominate, which are called bacteria deets, which are really good at digesting starch and fiber to prepare you for the winter months. So understanding that, we, that the light is changing dramatically from summer to winter to spring to fall, all of those, that light is changing dramatically. And, in, and, if we, and Ayurveda was tuned into the fact that if you go to the junction point for those seasons, that's sort of like a a supercharged healing experience that you, can, that you can experience. This is why the equinoxes and the solstices would be revered for thousands of years around the world, right? Because the, they were so critically important. They were healing times. And now we're beginning to see the science that can support that, those, that healing effect because the junction point from the Ayurvedic perspective between field and physiology and conscious and matter is how we can wake the body up to recognizing that the whole is much greater than the sum of the parts and is restoring the memory of pure consciousness into the cells, into the physiology, wakes us up to thin that veil between field and physiology and physical and, and the physical and spiritual nature of us, right? Uh, another one which I think is really cool is the gap between the breaths. I mean, in Ayurveda, breath retention or something called kumbhak was a really big deal. And when you talk to some Vedic experts, which I have, they really believe that the original Vedic texts, the Patanjali and the yoga, Hatha, Hatha Yoga Pradipika, when they mentioned pranayam, they meant that prana was breath and yam was to slow, expand, or extend the breath. And they said, if you don't hold your breath or extend your breath during pranayam, it's not actually Pranayam. So there's some really interesting science behind the breath when you look at the gap. First of all, when you breathe, you produce biophotons. When you use your diaphragm, you, you, you produce biophotons, which is light, right? And studies show that if you're breathing really shallow <laughs> in the upper chest, because you see a bear in the woods, that's going to create a fight or flight effect to save your life, catch up a tree, but there's 
a lot of repair that needs to be done after the emergency event, right? But if you learn how to breathe deeply and calmly and long and slow, it has a parasympathetic effect, a calming, rebuilding, rejuvenating effect, and it releases biophotons that are coherent that can be very healing for us. So learning how to breathe properly is really important. And with one study that came out just not long ago, that 91% of elite athletes had a, didn't have a diaphragm that was relaxing and contracting fully suggests that we all need to learn how to breathe. And the re main, main reason is because we sit too much, more than ever before. When we sit, the rib cage gets drammed down into the abdomen. The diaphragm is pushed into a pre-contracted position. And there's just no way it can fully contract and open up your rib cage. And the ribcage wants to always clamp down on your heart and your lungs 26,000 times per day, so it gets tighter and tighter and tighter. And we start to shallow breathe. And as a result of shallow breathing, not only activate the upper chest, fight or flight, incoherent biophoton receptors, triggering an, an emergency response, but we're also doing this thing they call overbreathing. And overbreathing means one study showed that when we breathe really shallow, we breathe in more oxygen than we can use. One study showed that 75% of the oxygen people breathe in, they, they breathe right back out unused. And when we breathe really shallow like that, and we breathe in more oxygen we can use, we pump out and breathe out all the CO2. So CO2 goes low and oxygen goes high, and that's the perfect storm for anxiety. In the old days, when Ayurvedic doctors would prescribe breath hold techniques called kumbhak, when they would we're going to describe the breath on an inhalation, like holding your breath on the inhale, like breathing in and holding your breath. You're holding in more oxygen, so it actually would stimulate you. So if you were lethargic and depressed and fatigued, you would give that kind of breath hold technique. But if you are anxious and worried, you would breathe out, get rid of the oxygen, breathe out, hold your breath. Carbon dioxide levels would then rise more rapidly, and that CO2 would calm you down. Just like with someone with a panic attack, you put a paper bag over their mouth, they rebreathe their CO2, and they they get calmed down. Studies, you know, in 19 clinics in the 1950s and 40s, they're all over America, where people would go in, we breathe a mixture of O2 and CO2, oxygen and carbon dioxide, that would dramatically calm people down from their anxiety. Of course, that fell out of favor when all the drugs came in, but the therapy still works. And we have a receptor in our neck that becomes very reactive to even the littlest bit of CO2 rising. So the more we get stressed out, the more we breathe more oxygen, the more we become reactive to even the littlest bit of CO2, so we can barely hold our breath for 10 seconds, or a minute, maybe max for most people. Where when you measure free divers who practice diving in deep into the ocean, the record today is 25 minutes. So imagine holding your breath for 25 minutes like a dolphin or a whale, it's amazing. Now I'm not we're suggesting you do that, but I am suggesting that we have the capacity to do that, like other mammals to hold our breath for extraordinary long periods of time. And what happens is when the oxygen levels are high and the CO2 levels are low, something called the Bohr effect, the bond between the oxygen and the CO2 becomes very, very tight. So the oxygen stays in your blood, not in your tissues, not in your brain, and your tissues can become somewhat hypoxic, not enough oxygen. And that lack of oxygen is damaging to your DNA. And again, release more of the incoherent biophotons from the damage of the DNA where mutagenic stem cells can take advantage of that situation. Where when you begin to lengthen your breath and hold your breath, the CO2 levels begin to rise and that bond between the CO2 oxygen and the, car and the hemoglobin in your blood becomes weaker. And all of a sudden the oxygen starts to flood into your tissues. So lengthening your breath, holding your breath are techniques that can actually deeply oxygenate your tissues and give the body that message like, huh, I have the oxygen I need. The war is over. So doing, you know, length, first, you know, learning how to lengthen your breath and breathe longer and slower, learning how to hold your breath over time can slowly allow your body to build what's called CO2 tolerance. And CO2 tolerance allows you to, you know, have um, that ability for the CO2 levels to rise. It calms you down, hyperoxygenates your tissues. But when that's happening, the oxygen in your blood starts to drop down a little bit. And when the oxygen in your blood starts to drop down from the 98% saturation in your blood to the 91 into the 80s, when you're in the 80s, you're in something called intermittent hypoxia. Intermittent hypoxia means that, that, that the body's in like 
a little bit of an emergency response, sort of like uh, when you uh, do calorie restriction or fasting, the body goes into something called autophagy, cellular repair and recycling, because there's no food. When you have the oxygen dropping low into your blood, but your tissues are being fed with plenty of oxygen, that's how the free divers do it, that creates a powerful healing effect where these emergency vehicles come in and they increase stem cell activation, nitric oxide, which won the Nobel Prize panacea molecule that cures everything, endothelial growth factors are produced, uh, EPO, the erythropoietin hormone that Lance Armstrong got busted for injecting, you can make your own self by holding your breath or lengthening your breath, going into this state of intermittent hypoxia. It's been shown to increase transcription factors, which are called guardians of your genome to protect your genome. My favorite of all is it increases what's been called neuroplasticity. Neuroplasticity is changing the old patterns of behavior, the stress patterns of behavior that are locked and written into the white waxy myelin sheath of our white matter that record the old patterns of behavior, make us do the same dumb things again and again and again. That's called tarpaka, kapha in Ayurveda, right? So, so this technique of holding your breath is just so beautiful, but again, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a creating a space, a wider space between the gap between, between the breaths. And when you breathe, the science shows biophotons are released. And again, they can be <laughs> incoherent or they can be coherent and healing. So another gap Sandhi therapy that allows us to heal at a very, very deep level. There's spaces between our thoughts. When you have, when you have incessant thinking, you just are in this remote program of, of doing the same thing again and again and again as you were programmed from a young age. But when you actually create a space between your thoughts and have time and you begin to wake the body up with Ayurvedic techniques that, that shine more light into the physiology so the feeling can be more aware of the truth versus the non-truth, of behaviors that actually serve you versus don't serve you, all of a sudden, when you have a space between the breath and your, you calm the system down, door number two begins to be a appear. Where instead of doing the same thing to door number one again and again and again, you can all of a sudden walk through a different door and change your old emotional patterns. One of my favorite kind of exercises that I do when I take a cold shower is you have the experience of the cold, which <gasps> makes you want to freeze up, and then you have your response to it, right? So when I go into a cold shower, I make sure that I have the experiences coming but I am them in control of my response. I don't let myself, re I can purposely relax into it and enjoy it and begin to widen the gap between your experience and your response to that experience. Another way to kind of widen the gap and help create more self-awareness at that level. And then of course, there's the gap between day and night, the sunrise and the sunset, maybe the most important gap of all. You know, um, in traditional cultures around the world, the sunrise and the sunset were revered. People did rituals, yoga, breathing, meditation during those times. Very, very important. And I was, I was um, uh, contacted by a bunch of researchers who were doing research on a technique in Ayurveda called Agnihotra, which is the ritual of, of meditating and chanting over a, a yellow ghee flame exactly at the moment of sunrise and exactly at the moment of sunset. And they asked me if I could do research on it. They had some research that showed that it was really good for mental health and addictions, and they wanted me to kind of dig in and see what I could figure out. And I found some science to show that, yes, the blue light in the morning, and an hour before the sunrise, there's something called the blue hour, where the blue and the violet light predominates. And that blue light, as we all know, right, blocks melatonin and helps us wake up. That same blue light at night from your screen or your television blocks melatonin and keeps you up at night, right? So, so by, um, by, by that morning, the morning blue and violet light wakes you up. But the study that I found showed that, that when the sun rises and the sun breaches the horizon, the red and the orange and yellow light creates a contrast between the blue, which is on the faster, high frequency side of the visual light spectrum, and the red 
on the slow side of the visual light spectrum, and that contrast is what actually turns on the biological clocks. Because early hominids and early apes, they didn't have color vision, they only had black and white vision, so they had to have something else besides blue light that would turn on and turn off our biological clocks. It turned out to be the contrast between those two frequencies of light, right? So when you stare at a yellow flame, an Agni Hotra, at that time of day, you're literally staring at a yellow flame with the blue light being scattered across the blue sky, because the blue is such a fast frequency, it doesn't penetrate, it scatters. That's why the sky is blue. And, and, that, and that contrast is enough to literally synchronize your biological clocks with nature's start of the day. So the body knows exactly at this moment in time when the sun rises, my biological clocks for a night should turn off, and my biological clocks for a day should turn on. So it would make sense, right? Because circadian medicine is Nobel Prize winning science, but that would be a really good thing for us to know how to do, to have that direct turn on and turn off. So now it turns out that, that this light that changes throughout the time of the day and also the seasons, it sort of creates the effect of the kapha time of day and the pitta time of day and the vata time of day. So we know though in Ayurveda that there's different times of day that activate different biological clocks and different functions throughout the day. Well, the old Ayurvedic seers, I imagine, were so perceptive, because their perception was so clear, <clears throat> that they could actually tell and see the difference between the difference between the different kinds of light that would change throughout the day, affecting a, a kapha time of day and a pitta time of day and a vata time of day. So in the morning hours, we have something called uh, the red and in infrared and the orange light in the sunrise predominates and the blue light is scattered. And the UV light, the one we know as the so-called damaging light, is, is a very high frequency wave. It gets blocked by the atmosphere, by the ozone, and it doesn't penetrate in the early morning hours. So during the morning hours, you are experiencing unopposed red and infrared light, which is extremely healing for the body. The UV light is blocked. The rule of thumb is that if, the, if you stand up in the morning and the shadow that the sun makes on you is longer than you are tall, you're in a period of red and infrared light with no UV damage radiation happening. So you're in a safe zone. The red and the infrared light are very penetrating rays that penetrate deeply into our skin, deeply through our skull. They have profound effects on the body. The infrared light penetrates deep into our cells and activates the mitochondria through an enzyme called cytochrome C oxidase, which activates the cells, the mitochondria, to make energy, ATP, adenosine triphosphate, which is the energy that we use in our body. So all that energy comes from the sun. I know they told us we didn't do photosynthesis, but that might have been a little bit premature. We take and convert infrared light through an enzyme in our cells called cytochrome C oxidase and convert it into energy. And the energy drives the energy we need for, for increased energy, for stamina, for muscular strength, for endurance, for immunity. That energy is also really important for um, protecting your skin. It builds collagen. A lot of cosmetic therapies are to put red light on your face to make it look clean and young and beautiful. Well, that's because it builds collagen. Well, the collagen originally was there to prepare you for the potential UV damage that comes in the middle of the day that could actually damage your skin. So the infrared and red light was, for, was preparation for the UV radiation. So the kapha time of day is when you need that energy for dig, dig ditches and plow fields and do all that physical labor, but it also protects you from uh, from, from excess kapha. It's been shown to, to help people lose weight. It's been shown to help heal you know, aspects of diabetes, which is a classic kapha condition. Whenever you make that energy in your cells, there's always waste products. And the waste products are called reactive oxygen species. And the body has to get rid of those waste products because they're linked to DNA damage incoherent damaging biophotons, which that bystander effect where the DNA damage and the release of incoherent biophotons could actually damage you and others around you, believe it or not. It's sort of crazy. So the body had to figure out a way to get rid of that DNA damage 
So it actually used that same enzyme, the cytochrome C enzyme from the infrared light to activate or create a molecule, which we call melatonin, the same one that puts you to sleep at night, is now used inside of your cell to mitigate the free radical damage caused by energy production. You know, whenever you make energy like in a, you know, a power plant, there's gonna be waste products. Same thing in the body. In the waste product, the reactive oxygen species is mitigated by melatonin. And that melatonin in your cells to mitigate the damage, to increase circulation and get rid of the waste, therefore get rid of the kapha, balance the kapha, at that time of day in the morning in particular, because it's unopposed at that time, is so powerful that it detoxifies the body and it's 90% of the melatonin that we produce in our body. And only 10% of the melatonin we produce at night for going to sleep. So the morning hours are for that kapha time. And the infrared light and the red light are the key ingredients to give us that kapha experience. Then as the sun moves to the middle of the sky, the, the UV light begins to you know, predominate. And this is really interesting because you always think that UV light is really damaging. And to a certain extent, it's also all a matter of dose. It is. Studies with uh, the last remaining hunter-gatherer tribes, the Tissimi from Brazil and the Haza tribe from Tanzania and the Sans Bushmen, they put light meters on them and they measured their circadian rhythms and they found that they got the vast majority of their light from the morning to noon and by after in the afternoon they found some shady spot and they were just not in the light. So traditional cultures knew that that morning light was really, really important and that's when they got their light. So we know that the UV rays are important and 95% of the UV radiation that we get in our body is the UVA rays and 5% is the UVB rays. UVB rays are the ones that make vitamin D and we all know that vitamin D is really important and many people are deficient in vitamin D and when you get vitamin D, it has a powerful healing effect. So yes, UV light is very important for us. The UVB rays make vitamin D, which protects your genetic code. It boosts your immunity, <clears throat> protects you from seasonal affective disorder and mood concerns. It balances your blood sugar. It supports healthy cardiovascular function. Um, it derives energy, uh, immunity, many, many things. But the UVA rays are the ones that everybody's so scared about and everybody paints their body with sunscreen because they want to block any UV damage at all. But it turns out that the UVA radiation in 1903 won the Nobel Prize for healing the skin. <laughs> it's been shown to be antimicrobial, it was shown to heal many infections and many diseases, particularly skin diseases like dermatitis and lupus and others. So the UVA radiation has been shown to do many things, it's been shown to really heal the body, but at a higher dose it can also be very damaging. So again, it's a a matter of dose. So between 10 o'clock and 2 o'clock in the afternoon, the UV light predominates and the pitta begins to increase. And that increase of pitta, that UV light, increases the heat, which is pitta, increases metabolism, energy, which is pitta. It increases our mood and energy, which we need to go make skyscrapers, which is a pitta thing to make things happen. It increases cognitive function and cognitive alertness. And you would always say those pitta are the drivers and they're very cognitively functional. But at the same time, that pitta, that UV light can also be very cooling. It can actually lower your blood pressure. It can increase that healing nitric oxide. It can, it can decrease um, the risk of cardiovascular disease. And of course, like I said, the Nobel Prize winning science so it can heal the skin and be also antimicrobial. So at the same time, the UV light is increasing the qualities of pitta and energy in the middle of the day and metabolism and digestion, eat your big meal in the middle of the day. The blue sky that's scattered over the sky, over the body, over the earth, is having a cooling effect on the body. And that blue light is also increases energy and cognitive function. And then when you combine the red and the blue and the green, the, the leftover rays of the visual light spectrum, you have something called white light, which is the stuff in here. What we can't really see, but when you actually combine red, blue, and green, it can becomes invisible white light. And that invisible white light has been shown to also increase mood, and increase alertness, but also somewhat uh, pitta pacifying and also somewhat vata pacifying, which is interesting. 
So as we move from, in, that's the Pitta time of day, and then we go into the Vata time of day from 2 o'clock in the afternoon until 6. And the UV light is very stimulating. It's very activating. The, the lakes become very turbulent. The wind begins to pick up. The dust in the atmosphere becomes quite predominant, quite different than the morning uh, sunrise when, the, when the, after a whole night of complete stillness, the daytime is very windy and very active and there's much scattered dust in the sky, which has a, a very diff had a different effect um, on us than the sunrise versus the sunlight, sunset. But between two o'clock and six in the afternoon, between two and four, the vata is really kicking up. You have the UV light, which, which is activating pitta, which is energy, which creates circulation and stimulation of the air, which is vata, which can overstimulate us in our mind, but also give us more cognitive function and more energy in during that vata time of day. And then around four o'clock in the afternoon, the UV light starts to drop into the sky and the UV light begins to be blocked. And now we have, once again, a brewing of mostly red and infrared light. And red and orange light that we begin to see happening towards the sunset is a very kapha and vata balancing ray. So that begins to balance our vata and dial down our vata to a certain extent and help to keep the whole vata energy in balance. And, but the infrared light is still driving more energy. And that red light is beginning to predominate as we get closer to the sunset. So as we go from two to six, six being the sunset exactly, that's where the vata starts to really become calmed down and balanced. The first half, vata is stimulated because of the UV light. Second half, vata is balanced because of the lack of UV light and the stimulation of the uh, of the infrared light and the red light creating more energy in the body. But don't forget that energy, that UV light is producing melatonin that also neutralizes and keeps the body calm and balanced and keeps the release of those photons somewhat balanced as well. Then at sunset, you have the beautiful orange color. The wind and the dust creates a, a blocking effect of the blue light even more. So you don't get that contrast of the red and yellow and orange to the blue. So you don't get that melatonin inhibiting effect. The orange light seems to pervade. The blue light is much more dull and you get a, a melatonin surging effect into the evening, into the afternoon. And the, and the infrared light begins to continue to, to surge because the light is still in the sky and the infrared light bounces all over and it's still bouncing and penetrating into our body and it's creating again another dose of that kapha and before we go to sleep at night there's a surge of ATP energy that helps the body get the energy it needs to go to sleep. Studies in Ayurveda say that we need energy to go to sleep. Most people say I can't sleep because I'm, I have too much energy, I have too much energy and you, they sedate you but the real reason most people can't sleep is because they're exhausted and we need we need um, to rebuild and rejuvenate and give the body the energy it needs so it can then, in fact, go to sleep. And the studies show that's exactly what happens. The ATP energy surges before you go to bed. That ATP, the adenosine triphosphate, then breaks into uh, phosphates and adenosine. And the adenosine is the molecule then that sedates the body and helps it go to sleep. During that time, as the, as the orange light you know, begins to brew and night starts to come, the melatonin surges and the melatonin does put us to sleep. It's not a hormone. It doesn't actually suppress your natural production when you take it. It's more of a molecule that's designed to reset your biological clocks with nature's circadian rhythms. And it's a powerful vata balancing agent. During the, the pitta time of night between 10 and two, the biological clocks for detox kick in glutathione, superoxide dismutase, catalyzed enzymes for liver detox kick in. The melatonin, 400 times more melatonin is produced in your gut to do tissue repair and microbial repair in your gut than even in your brain. And that's all circadian melatonin. So there's a massive reset of your, of your microbiome at night while you sleep as well. Then as we go into the wee hours of night between two and six, the biological clocks for deep sleep kick in and the melatonin is peaking at that time to keep us in that really deep vata balancing sleep. You know, studies show that melatonin is also a very powerful 
blood pressure lowering agent, a very powerful agent of repair and rebuilding, which is shown to reverse breast cancer and osteoporosis, but it's also been shown to be a powerful anti-anxiety agent. Studies show that, that they compared an anti-anxiety medication with melatonin for people with pre-surgical anxiety, and the melatonin actually was as effective as the drug for anxiety. So melatonin is a very powerful calming effect. It helps anxiety, it resets your circadian rhythms, and it's a really powerful piece of the puzzle. So the point here as we talk about beautifully how the sun and the light actually creates vata pitta kapha, both in the daytime and the seasons, which I think is just magical, but also the gaps between the seasons, the gaps between the breath, the gaps between the thoughts, the gaps between the day and the night are kind of supercharged times where you can go and get recharged and heal the body at a very deep level. Because at that time, the light is more precious. The light is more concentrated. It's in transition. And when the light is in transition from one time to the other, this is when Ayurveda says that the light actually becomes active at the junction point, more so. When I was in India studying Ayurvedic medicine, I, used to, I learned how to take my pulse as a diagnostic tool, and I would always write down all the little things that I would learn and during the day and what I would feel, the time of day and what I would feel and the pulse and all of that. And I noticed that my pulse would change from one time of a day to the other. And after seasons, I noticed that my pulses were more predominant in pitta in the pitta season and more predominant in kapha in the kapha season and more predominant at the vata time of day and the vata time of day. So it was really interesting. And my teacher said, why don't you take the pulse at the junction point between those times of day? And when I did that, I felt the pulse change. And, you know, I felt the vata pulse come down and then come back into the middle and then come back up into the, uh, into the kapha time of day. And after the kapha time of day, I felt the kapha come down and go into the pitta time of day. It was kind of really quite amazing. And the, the, the model of the pulse is quite interesting. And I have a whole pulse course on that if you like more, if you're really interested in this. It's really a phenomenal study is that the pulse is like a big lake, and at the top of the lake, is, the turbulence is always changing. And the bottom of the lake is very still and very calm, reflecting your body type, the part of you that doesn't change, but also reflecting um, that field of consciousness from which we come. And when the consciousness becomes the physiology, which is the surface part of the pulse, where things are always changing, if you could put your attention at the junction between the, the two pulses, you can become more aware and help heal the body at a really deep level. And it said that the pulse changes because it goes from, from the vata time into the kapha time at the junction point. So one of the techniques to create more wakefulness at the junction point, another gap therapy, is to take your pulse at the junction point during the change over times of day or change over times of season. So I was teaching a course in the late 1980s in LA, an Ayurvedic pulse diagnosis course which I taught for decades still teaching, actually. And one of the guys in the course fainted in the middle of the course, fell off his chair, fainted. We stopped the course, we helped him up, put him back on his chair, he was okay. He said he wanted to finish the course. We did. After the course, I went up to him and said, are, are you okay? And he said, yeah, I'm okay. It's weird though, you know, I, I only fainted once before in my life and about uh, 10 years ago, I was in Mexico and had this weird clammy feeling and faint feeling and, and sweaty and all that and I fainted. And weirdly, while I was in this pulse course, as I was taking my pulse, I got that same clammy feeling, that same sweaty feeling, nausea, and I just fell off my chair. Woke up, you know, and, um, and ever since then, I've had this pain in my liver area and my chest area, and it's never gone away. And, uh, and I've gone to every doctor and healer you can imagine, even come to this pulse course hoping Ayurveda can help me heal it, and to see if I could kind of figure out what to do. I said, well, gosh, you know, I said, you want to, I said, can you give me your phone number and I call you in a couple of weeks? And so I called him a couple of weeks and he said, I said, I said, how's it going? Are you okay? And he said, yeah, actually, you know, ever since I took your pulse in that course, that pain in my rib cage and my chest here left. It's completely gone now and I haven't felt it in weeks. And I saw him, I used to go to LA regularly and teach and so on way back when. And uh, he, I see him regularly, and he, for years, told me it was gone. It was complete healing. So when I talked to my teachers back in India, they were like, 
Oh yes, oh yes, this is, you know, miracle therapy, they called it, Vedic science therapy, the therapy that could heal with awareness or attention. And again, when you put your healing awareness at the healing at the junction point between consciousness and matter, and you wake the body up, and if it put the light there and it shines into the field, into the physiology, you restore the memory of pure consciousness, so the memory of proper function, the memory of functioning as the whole as opposed to the parts, and the healing is spontaneous, right? Because you created an awareness at the fundamental level of imbalance, which I think is really quite phenomenal. So the idea in Ayurveda is that this is really living a sattvic life. You know, uh, a, a sattvic life is, um, you know, what we're talking about. You know, learn, realizing that giving and caring and loving others is the most rewarding thing. I wrote an article at lifespot.com called The Science of Sattva. And we now know that when you give and love and care for others in a way that your telomeres lengthen, you live longer, you produce less damaging DNA biophoton emissions, and you produce more coherent and healing ones. We know you produce more oxytocin, which is the healing, bonding, loving, and longevity hormone. We know that the good bugs are, are replaced bad bugs when you give care and love. We know that, that giving and caring for others is a major source of happiness. A study in 136 countries around the world, when people gave versus got, they were significantly happier when they gave. And they even did it in the poorest countries where they had nothing to give it when they gave that still made them happier when they got, even though they had nothing to start with. It was really quite amazing. So the science of sattva is really the science of light. In Ayurveda, what's really beautiful is when you start to realize and respect the things that our traditional ancestors did. The sunrise, the sunset. You know, when you meditate, the space between the mantra, if you use a mantra, the space between the thoughts, the space between the, these, the seasons. These are all sacred times where traditional cultures would revere the light. And the more we can, we can and live a sattvic giving light, life, the more we can become more joyful, more happy, and not only just thin the veil between the physical and the spiritual, and maybe even at some point become a, a really realized passenger on this crazy journey of the soul, but more importantly, what I find is that when you begin to really appreciate nature and the changes in the light and the beauty of nature, spirituality becomes spontaneous. You don't have to go to church because you were taught to go to church and that's what spiritual life is because you were taught it from a young child. It's, that's something you have to do. It's something... And of course, you can become spontaneously spiritual in the church in any religion for sure. But the traditional people didn't always have the church. They just had nature and all this new science about nature healing and, you know, and forest bathing and nature therapy. It's all about being in the wilderness where the light and the infrared light is bouncing off of every tree. It literally doesn't bounce off buildings. It, if you take a look at infrared photography and you look at what an infrared photography looks like a city, it just looks like a regular city. You don't even notice any difference. You take a look at infrared photography of a jungle or a forest or a field, it's exploding with bright, bright infrared light when you look at infrared photography. When you walk into a field, you're being blasted with infrared light. When you walk into a city, it's devoid of infrared light. So that light is what wakes us up. And it still, it creates, uh, it stills us. It activates that DNA to make, the mitochondria to make the energy, which gives us the energy to, to also become calm and to become stable. And the more we begin to appreciate those beautiful rhythms of nature, I believe that we begin to start to realize and appreciate um, the subtle versus the more overt, overt and the gross. You know, in Ayurveda, the things that are the most subtle are considered to be the most profound, you know, like the circadian rhythms. We can't see them, but they are definitely uh, running the show. This Nobel Prize winning science, the biological clocks turning off and turning on can heal you or create problems within you. The microbiome, we can't see them, but they, 
govern what you think and say and eat and desire and crave. So we know that these things that are very subtle are very, very powerful. In Ayurveda, the more subtle it is, the more powerful it is. So when you think about light, it is very subtle. We just take it for granted. 90% of the time, the average American is indoors, out away from the light. So how are we supposed to become enlightened? How are we supposed to activate this light inside of us when we're never in the light? These biophotons have been shown to be circadian in nature. They change with the light. There are more of them in the summer and more of them during the day and less in the winter and at nighttime, suggesting that we really do need to be in the light to experience the light, to wake us up, and to stop producing these survival biophotons as a result of DNA damage and stress and start to dial those down so we can experience the subtle light. See, the, the coherent biophotons are, are underneath the raging damage of the DNA that happens in our crazy, polluted, stressful life and stressful world. So using these Ayurvedic tools to dial that down so we can begin to perceive the subtle, the biophotons at a very subtle level that are coherent, and use them with our intention while during a meditation or during prayer to not only kind of help us heal and stay healthy, but also have the intention to help others, uh, our neighbors, and of course, this crazy planet that we live in right now could use some coherent biophotons. So please, I hope you enjoyed this lecture. Uh, I have lots of articles on my website at lifespot.com about biophotons. You can read more about the science behind it. And please stay tuned at lifespot.com for more. Thanks for listening. I'm Dr. John Deere. Do you like this video? Don't forget to subscribe and share. This recording is brought to you by LifeSpa, where ancient Ayurvedic wisdom meets modern science. Get access to free health video newsletters by Dr. John at LifeSpa.com. These statements have not been evaluated by the FDA. These products are not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease.